400 table over there. And um, so our next speaker, you might have noticed these on your um, table, hopefully you did. Um, I noticed the title or the um, little tagline here, The Secret to Massive Results, which, you know, makes me really intrigued to read it because I need that. Um, but we're really lucky to have Dr. Roland Roberts here with us today um, of the Business Battleground. He's also the former um, CEO of Hoverboard, which was the single hottest global consumer product of 2015. And um, talked to him about the possibility of him arriving on a Hoverboard, um, but there were some logistical issues in making that happen. Um, but thought that might have been fun. Um, he's also an internationally renowned best-selling author, CEO, TV personality, um, so we're really lucky to have him join us here. He's recognized as one of the top 100 most influential Floridians, so that's kind of cool. Um, and without further ado, um, Dr. Roland Roberts. Thank you. Well, it's wonderful to be with everyone today. You just heard my highlight reel, but um, what I really want to do is tell you all the bad, all the failures. Uh, you know, I had accumulated several million dollars worth uh, of real estate and property by the time I was 22 years old. And, uh, and then I ended up losing it all, literally almost overnight, uh, taken right off the money, me, trusting the wrong person. I know what it's like to sleep in my car for two months. I know what it's like to be lied to, lied about, slandered, bullied, defrauded. You know, I've, I've been through two IRS audits. I've uh, worked with the SEC, the FDA, the FBI any alphabet agency you can just about uh, imagine. And then I also was a senior executive at a Fortune 500 company and a multi-billion dollar publicly held company that was the first to go public with a data breach in 2006. And that ended up proving to be, uh, to change the course of my career. And what I've learned is this, if you don't learn how to handle crisis, if you don't learn how to handle failure, if you don't learn how to run companies with minimal resources and handle being on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and handle uh, uh, bad re customer reviews or handle undercover cameras coming in your business and in your meeting. If you don't learn how to handle crisis, then you will never experience the kind of success that you otherwise would have. What I wanna share with you over the next few minutes is three essential keys to success worth having. Every single person in this room, and under the sound of my voice at this moment, is highly accomplished. You are all exceptional leaders in your vocation and in your level of influence. But all the success in the world doesn't mean anything if you don't learn uh, three essential keys to success worth having. See, I believe that you can create multi-billion dollar international conglomerates and keep your family. I believe that you can create high-growing international companies and uh, keep your health. And, and, and be able to sleep at night. And uh, I, I think it takes extra effort, it takes extra investment, but, uh, but it's absolutely worth it. In fact, it's the only kind of success that's worth having. It's prosperity without sorrow, and it's wealth without pain. I grew up in a holler in West Virginia, uh, only one three-way stop sign in the town that I grew up in. We uh, have a three-way stoplight now at that spot. And uh, so it's really grown, I think it's up to about 1,100 people or so now. And uh, so, but it was a fantastic way to grow up. The only thing we knew how to do was work hard and learn good old fashioned values. Went off to college and uh, uh, just started with nothing and started uh, getting promoted at, at work and then took the money, used some uh, advances off of some, uh, some cash advances off of credit cards that I was able to secure at 18 and uh, used that to invest in real estate. And then uh, after I lost everything a few years later, uh, I remember sitting at the lake house and as I was leaving, I was sitting on, on the bench, and I was just, I was a, I was a wreck. I, I mean, you just lost everything. It was the highest I'd ever been in my life, thought it was the highest I'd ever go. And I'm sitting on that bench, and I remember saying to myself, I was trying to decide how to handle it, and I thought, today is the poorest I will ever be the rest of my life. And I made that commitment, and I didn't know whether it would happen or not happen, but it really didn't matter. What it allowed me to do was take the next step. It was in that moment that I chose to get back up again because it's hard for an empty bag to stand up straight. One of the things, whenever I started our CEO huddles a few years ago, uh, I thought it was gonna be me and two other people around the table every other week or one, for one hour a week, kind of iron sharpens iron. 
And uh, now we have nearly 9,000 entrepreneurs in the United States that meet every other week or once a month. And um, whenever I started those, uh, the first thing I did was say, everyone take off your masks and put them in the middle of the table. I don't want to hear how good your business is doing. I don't want to hear how amazing you are. I certainly don't want to hear another 30 second elevator speech. What I want to hear is what the real problems are. I want to hear what's wrong. I want to hear what's not working. I want this to be the place that, that you can come and it is safe to be vulnerable and transparent. It's not the norm, but there's enough norm out there. And if you're an entrepreneur or an innovator worth your salt, then you're going to learn to be comfortable with being vulnerable and transparent. So uh, what I ended up, as I was, after I made that commitment to get back up again and, and, and go for it, uh, I ended up getting a job and I was fortunate enough to get a job at the multi-billion dollar public health company. Three months into it, I got promoted into a senior executive position. Ended up growing that division to nearly 1,500 employees. And uh, it was in 2005, uh, Q3, uh, in the Q3 on two, in 2005, that I got the call on a Sunday morning uh, from the CEO's office uh, saying he wants you on a call in an hour, and that was whenever I learned about our data breach. It was 120,000 records, and that ended up proving, uh, I ended up championing our crisis response. What I thought may be six months turned into the next two years of dealing with that data breach and uh, have, have dealt with crisis for companies and countries and everything else in between over the last 10 years along the same track. Uh, so what I, what I learned uh, is that the first thing you must handle for success worth having is crisis. Obviously, as CEO of the hoverboard company, you may have gotten, uh, received a Google alert or two about the, uh, our, us being banned from different airlines. You may, uh, and it was, they, they didn't just say it's banned from the airlines. It was every day they had to name every single one. Delta banned them, American Airlines banned them, United banned them. And then that wasn't enough. It was like this school campus and that school campus. And I'll tell you, the one that really got me <laughs> was when I woke up and like a place of worship had banned us. And I'm like, of every campus or something. And I'm like, man, we can't go anywhere. Uh, I certainly wasn't able to bring one on the plane today. So, uh, but you know, handling crisis, uh, we had over 300 uh, Chinese manufacturers knocking off our product, costing us nearly a billion dollars. That's, uh, th there's a lot at stake. There's a lot of strategy. Uh, that goes into that, but there was a lot of crisis that must be dealt with. And then the single greatest crisis and turnaround uh, for me was uh, whenever I was CEO of a 29-year-old manufacturing company. They were the largest harvesters of blue-green algae in the world. And uh, the company had declined in revenue every single month for 15 straight years. It was a wonder that they were even in business. And uh, it, was a, it was, you can imagine the employees that had stayed through all of that. It was not the ones that could go jump to a, a thriving company. It was the ones who really didn't have a lot of alternatives. And so the culture was absolutely uh, atrocious and not an environment for success at all. Uh, our customers wanted us to grow. The board wanted us to grow, but they didn't want anything to change. We don't want to change technology. We don't want to uh, add personnel or take away personnel. Uh, we don't want to do anything different, uh, but we want to grow. So uh, that turnaround required absolutely every bit of effort and energy. Uh, and we were doing business in India. We were doing business uh, in Europe and, uh, and had an office in both locations in London and in Dubai. Uh, and so that was an incredible uh, crisis opportunity. Revenue uh, loss in a company uh, is a crisis, <laughs> especially whenever it's been that long. After 90 days, we ended up having their first growth month in 15 years. And I talk about that a little bit in the 90 day race, uh, but, but you've got to learn how to handle crisis. I wanna give you three things in times of crisis that'll help you. Number one, know your inner circle. You must know your inner circle. Whenever Herbalife and Bill Ackman was, were going at it starting a couple years ago, when people are betting a billion dollars to be able to take your stock down to zero, uh, you know, those are times of crisis. Uh, you better know who your inner circle is. You better know who you can trust. The second thing is you better validate your counsel. You are only as good as the counsel you get. You may have a bunch of generals in the room, but if they aren't, if you aren't getting sound counsel and objective counsel and competing counsel, then you're not able to really reconcile in your mind the best response. And then the third thing in the times of crisis is to communicate openly, honestly, and transparently. A foreign concept for both business and political people today. Uh, the second thing you must handle for success worth having is growth. You must handle growth. How, if you've ever 
led or been the CEO of a high growth company when you are growing uh, by leaps and bounds month after month after month, uh, there's a bunch of pressure and, and uh, decision making that happens. You make decisions in the course of three months that other businesses growing at 10% a year don't make in three years. It literally is an intense uh, uh, environment to say the least. It can also, it's, it's obviously fun and exhilarating and everybody is running off of adrenaline as well. But there's a couple of things I want you to focus on when you're handling the growth. Number one is excellence. Number one is excellence. Uh, you know, be, have the objective to be number one or number two in the world. If you're going to start a business, if you've got a product, a service, or a widget, don't play not to lose. Don't play just to, just to make a few bucks. You play to win. You play all out, and, uh, and you have a spirit of excellence. Uh, it's not about being perfect. Uh, it's, about, it's about excellence. My first generation product should look very different than my 10th generation product. But it doesn't mean uh, my first generation was as perfect. It was excellent at the time it was launched. And then we were able to kind of come up with version two and three and four and so on. And you constantly strive for excellence. The second uh, area you must handle growth is in execution. There's a lot of people, there's no shortage of ideas. When I go into a company to turn them around, uh, I can ask them and ask the, the leadership team, what do you think we need to do? What do we need to start doing? What do we need to stop doing? That's usually the case. And so uh, they'll give me a whole laundry list. I don't have to come up with the ideas. They already have it. Where companies struggle is in the execution. It's in the, the leadership being able to say, this is what we're gonna do, and this is how we're gonna do it. And you know why that is? Because they lack vision. They lack the ability to say, I know where we are going, and this is how we can get there, and then get the buy-in, and the buy-in is coming because you've listened to everyone. You're not a bull in a china shop. You have the right spirit. And in, in a high growth environment, that is the way to lead. Uh, I think one of the keys that is also missing uh, as it relates to execution is focus. The reason I became the CEO of the hoverboard company was because of a speech I did that ended up on YouTube called the Single Fork Strategy. And I basically talked about focus. I talked about how most companies when they're choosing what markets to enter, what products to come out with, they are so scatterbrained that they fail every single time. And how, have you ever seen a 10 person start a, a company with 10 employees and they're talking about all the markets they're in or all the things that they're gonna do? And it's like it's a recipe for disaster. If they would focus on their core competency, if they focus on what they do best, uh, and I talk about even the airlines. Uh, you see, uh, I compare the top five airlines and their market cap to uh, like Southwest a couple of years ago, and there's some others now that are great examples of it, and their market cap was significantly higher than the top five. And the reason for that was because of the single fork strategy. When, uh, see, you and I, most of us, when we come to a fork in the road, what do we do? We take it. Well, should I be uh, cater to business travel or personal travel? Should I cater to uh, uh, the recreational traveler or should I uh, go to this destination? Major markets, minor markets. How many uh, aircraft should I fly? Uh, well, if you have seven types of aircraft, you have to have seven different types of parts for every single one. That's why I'm sitting in the airport for two days waiting for you to get a part somewhere. Whereas if all we're flying all the same planes because we are so focused on knowing who we serve, uh, it, makes, it makes life a lot easier and a lot, for a lot happier customers. See, I think there's two questions that most of us get wrong. Number one, uh, what product uh, do you have? What, what product do you, uh, uh, pro what problem do you solve? And the second thing is who owns that problem? I, I don't, uh, the, one of the biggest challenges when it comes to focus is that companies and entrepreneurs especially, they join the idea of the month club. Someone else earlier referred to it as the sh uh, not chasing the shiny objects. I think the idea of the month club is one of the biggest killers in environments. Uh, if people would just execute on the ideas that we had last month or last, last quarter or last year that we committed to. Uh, but it's always easier to start the new thing. And it's kind of some job security. You know, there's less, there's less accountability uh, when you do that. But I, I think it's, uh, it's absolutely uh, fundamental and mandatory. The last thing as you're handling growth is to be innovative, be unconventional. You create products and services that people don't even know that they need. I'm so tired of Me Too products. It's not something brand new. It is a minor improvement off of something existing. If you wanna win in the entrepreneurial game, don't just tweet, you absolutely innovate. Uh, I, I personally am of the opinion that you take fewer polls, fewer surveys, and you create products and build products that matter and that change people's lives, and you're going to experience success. 
uh, especially whenever your customers don't even know that they have that need or want. The third thing you must handle for success worth having is influence. There's a responsibility that comes with leadership and, and success. You know, in the political and sports arena, we see every day, every day, how a lapse in judgment uh, results in a loss of influence. I mean, you can think Enron, Tiger Woods, politicians, you name it. Lack of judgment and leadership. I believe that as leaders, it's incumbent upon all of us to manage our legacy, to be intentional about building legacy. Your decisions today in your company, in your personal life, they affect not only your personal legacy, they affect your company's legacy. They have, they have bearings on your country. We were talking about the, uh, another continent a few minutes ago and uh, kind of the, the uh, obstacles that are created in doing business there because of some preconceived notions, right or wrong. And, and I can tell you that uh, integrity matters and, and it, it, it absolutely affects the future generations. See, I think that entrepreneurship uh, is an incredible vehicle to, for, to unite a global. I think co commerce is a very powerful uh, phenomenon. It transcends your cultures, it transcends religion, sexual orientation, your faith, your, your beliefs, your, your cultural uh, 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 propensities. It absolutely uh, uh, transcends all of that. And so when you are meeting people's needs and wants, make decisions in light of your legacy. Focus on significance more than you do wealth accumulation. 32 days ago, 32 days ago, I was lying in a parking lot, my clothes bloodied and ripped. I had just dropped my ladies off at a restaurant and shopping center because it was pouring down rain, drove, uh, went to park the car, I'm in Boston, park the car, and as I was walking in, a car came speeding through the parking lot and took me out. Hit me here, I bounced twice on the hood, I don't remember after that, but I ended up shattering the windshield and ricocheting off. I lied there, in, the, in, the, in the, the bloody mess that they had to end up cutting my clothes off for the next 30, 40 minutes while it, the ambulance was there and attending to me and then rushing me to the hospital. What I'm telling you is when it comes to handling influence, we all have a grave responsibility. In an instant, your company doesn't matter. In an instant, your problems, your revenue, your employees, your international relations, that everything on your to-do list immediately gets canceled. Immediately. You never know, and it happens in a split second. See, I believe I was lucky, blessed, highly favored, and have a calling and, and a purpose that, that transcends you know, whatever may have befall, befallen me, and so do you, so does each one of you. You make such a difference in this world. The impact that everybody in this room has, and if we went from this place and we leverage that and we harness that as a unified front for entrepreneurship and global commerce, it would be amazing. You could not stop the results that initiated from this conference just because of that, with a focus on significance and a focus on legacy. I'm gonna give you four things in closing. That, that you have to be in order to have influence and to maximize your influence. Uh, the first thing you must be is careful. You must be careful. Uh, you are known by the company that you keep. Uh, you know, you are or soon will be who your friends are. Uh, you attract who you are, not who you want. You wanna know, uh, A players don't work for B managers. Honest people don't work for dishonest people. Whenever you hear people talking about they want to, uh, I wish I could just attract this kind of woman, or I wish I could attract this kind of man, or I wish I attracted employees who showed up on time, or I just wish I could find contractors who would do what they say they would do, will do when they say they will do it. It's a being problem, not a do problem. I can't tell you how many amateurs come to me and say, Roland, tell me what to do and I'll do it. That's the wrong question. And I have. I used to have. I would go up to somebody, think of somebody who's successful and say, what do I have to do? If you tell me to stand on the corner upside down for three days and I'll you know, be highly successful, I'll do that because I'll do anything you tell me to do to, to attain that result. 
And then I realized there's not nothing that you have to do, but it's something you have to be, and that's much harder. That's something none of us want to do because it requires change. First, we have to be careful. Be careful of your associations. Be careful of who you associate with. The second thing you must uh, be in order to manage your handle influence is passion. Business is my art. It is our art. I'm passionate about entrepreneurship, and I certainly want to be a Picasso and not a $7 special at TJ Maxx. I mean, I want to do what I do with excellence. That's why we have the CEO huddle. It's why we have the CEO entrepreneur crew uh, coming up, uh, where people can just take off the mask, put it in the put it in the table, leave it on land, and just get real with one another, and be able to do deals and do business and create those kind of lifelong relationships uh, in, in a very safe uh, environment. I, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, that we do is host entrepreneur workshops. Um, for for around for countries for universities uh, high schools for uh, communities and that has been one of the most inspiring things that I've done because I've been able to see people just literally bring an idea and three hours later walk away with a business in hand that they can transact be passionate about what you do I eat sleep and breathe what I do uh, because it's my calling the third thing you must be is generous. You must be generous to handle influence. Giving is the only proof that you have conquered grief. Generosity is not a capital campaign. It is a spirit. It is an ongoing, how can I bless somebody? How can I help somebody? How can I give an encouraging word to someone today? It's not looking for all the wrongs and how horrible everybody is. It's how can I lift them up as opposed to tearing them down? Uh, and then the fourth thing you must be is courageous. You must be courageous. Uh, let past successes create the courage you need to be bold and to be uh, do innovative things. Uh, even David had said that uh, the only reason he fought Goliath was because he had killed a bear before. He had killed a lion in the past. How you talk to yourself will help create faith or fear uh, for you to be able to move into the deep and do what you need to do as entrepreneurs and as global leaders. How you talk to yourself, your self-talk, and, and whenever everyone is doubting you. When I was on, the, the t on TV talking about the fires when the hoverboard company uh, was struggling uh, with, with that, it wasn't even our hoverboards. It was the knockoff hoverboards that were using inferior batteries. Half the, 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 the quality of materials that they were supposed to use if they did not want fires. Didn't matter. We were the ones that had the patent. We were the ones that, that were the face of the problem that wasn't even ours. Now, I can be upset about that. I can say, well, that's not our problem. I spent two days trying to tell everybody the difference in batteries after my marketing department prepped me on it. And then I realized to the John Q. Public, a hoverboard's a hoverboard's a hoverboard. So, uh, so we had to change the strategy. But you have to be courageous. There are three enemies of success. It's doubt, discouragement, and distractions. And the only courage uh, overcomes those three enemies. I want you to leave this conference with more internal fortitude, more determination, more faith, more confidence to make bold moves. I want you to raise the bar for everyone. I want you to set a higher standard and expect greater results for you and your life and your business, your company, and your country. I absolutely love horses. Uh, when I was 15, I worked on a ranch for a couple of years in summers. Uh, four cowboys tending uh, over 110 head of horses. When I got back that summer, from that summer uh, on the ranch, I wanted, uh, I wanted my dad to be proud of me. So I, my dad didn't like horses. Something happened as a kid, rode one one time, and you know, never wanted to be on another horse. So I got back to that summer and I said, hey dad, I really would love to just take you riding. And a friend of ours had two horses. One was named Lily uh, and one was Major. Major was absolutely psychotic. Uh, he was massive. And he just had a mind of his own, and he could be doing great, and then he would just flip out. I mean, just absolutely try to run me into a tree, fall down on me, just anything. He was just crazy. And then the Lily was a trail horse, and she was just as sweet and kind as you can imagine. Her head never came up, you know, very high, and she had one speed, and it was reverse. <laughs> and so I said, Dad, I'll ride Major, you ride Lily, nothing can happen. It's impossible. Uh, and so he agreed, and we had heard about this uh, pond that was across a mountain in the hills of West Virginia, and, uh, and so I said, we're going to go find that. So sure enough, we spent you know, all morning tracking back on horseback through the woods. We found the pond, and it was serene, it was gorgeous. 
We, we tied up the horses, we sat there, had lunch, we're on the way back. I then find out, uh, we get to a clearing, and I wanted my dad to be proud of me. I mean, I watched enough Roy Rogers and John Wayne, you know, and I was like, I'm gonna show him, 16 years old, like, I'm gonna show him how I can run this horse, this beast across the field. And, uh, you know, you get your heart pounding, your heart racing. And so sure enough, I take off, and I told my dad, you stay here, and uh, I'm gonna run across the field. He said, okay. So uh, I take off, and I'm like, ah, ah. I mean, I'm hauling across this field. I get to the other side, and I turn around to see the proud look on my father's face. And instead, what I saw was Lily, being the good trail horse that she was, had spooked, took off in the opposite direction in a dead run. My, my dad's saddle had shifted underneath her belly. He, his foot was caught in a stirrup, and he's being dragged through a foot-deep swamp. I didn't know if he was alive. I didn't know if he was being trampled. I didn't know what was happening. I whip Major around, and I start calling now after my dad. And I pull up. I finally get up next to him, and I lean out of the saddle, and I grab a hold of the halter, and start to, and the bride will start bringing, bringing Lily to a stop. Everybody is just, I mean, just uh, out of it at that point, just really hyped up. And so we, we uh, my dad was okay, no broken bones. I, I was the only one that ended up breaking something whenever I was grabbing into the bridle. And we got to the edge of the woods, and we all just sat there for about a half hour. Everybody kind of just calmed down. And then it was time, and I said, all right, well, my dad said, well, you ready to get back? I said, yeah. And I just felt like a complete failure. I mean, all I wanted was to have a great father-son time with my dad. And I, and I said, okay, yeah, I'm ready. And so I just grabbed, grabbed Major's reins and started heading back. And he said, well, what are you doing? I said, Head, heading back to the barn. He said, well, aren't you supposed to, get, aren't you supposed to ride him? And uh, I said, yes, but I didn't think there's any way in the world you're getting back on a horse. And he said, well, I've heard you talk enough about horses, and, you know, if you don't get back up, then they can say, you know, there's, there's training issues and everything else. And he said, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. I'm, I'm going to get back up there. Am I... Dad got back up on that horse, and we rode the rest of the way back to that barn. You know, my dad never sat me down and said, son, when life, you know, hands you lemons and knocks you down, you get back up on the horse. You know, there was no philosophical lessons that day. But what I saw in his example is something that I obviously carry with, with me to this day. And some of you in your business, some of the efforts, some of the initiatives that you guys are engaged in, and you're doing some monumental global impactful uh, initiatives and maybe they're going slower than what you want maybe you're not as effective as you wish you would be maybe you're not recruiting enough and you're not selling enough and this isn't working out in this currency exchange and that that lithium-ion battery and this regulation and that let me tell you get back up on that horse again decide right now what you need to stop doing or what you need to start doing and i want you to you send that text right now you make that phone call before the next speaker. You take action right now so that you don't leave here the same way you walked in here today. Be courageous. Thank you very much.